Today, we're here to discuss Malik and Deja in the 1995 film, Are You Learning?, and whether they would have made it long term as a couple if Deja hadn't met such a tragic end. Written and directed by John Singleton, Higher Learning is a powerful portrayal of the social, economic, and academic struggles of college life for a diverse group of incoming freshmen. Malik, played by Omar Epps, and Deja, played by Tyra Banks, are both athletes on the college's track team who fall in love and try to balance academics and the challenging dynamics of diversity on campus. Of course, we all know how the film ends. But what if Deja wasn't lost? Do you think Deja and Malik would have made it long-term as a couple after the camera stopped rolling? We'll discuss this and more. I'm Height. And I'm Cherie. And you've discovered Axiom Amnesia. A lot of you requested that we cover this film, and I can't wait for us to talk about it. But first, we want to thank all of the supporters who helped to make this video possible. If you want your name to appear alongside these contributors, make a one-time donation via Cash App, or click the thanks button on this video, or you can head on over to patreon.com slash axiomamnesia, or become a channel member by clicking the join button to enjoy all of the benefits of becoming a monthly subscriber. Yeah, so the question is whether or not Deja and Malik would make it. First, I think we have to stop and take a look at exactly what happened in the film and talk about that, and then we'll be able to loop back and answer this question. So we, now we see that Malik is actually an athlete. He's there, uh, presumably on a scholarship of some form. And he is, you know, this rookie superstar athlete. And he comes late to practice and his coach is not happening. And he's like, hey, get off my field. Get off my field. It's like that. That's how you made it. And Malik doesn't realize the consequences of his actions here, that he's not really serious, but he will soon find out. Before even getting off the field, Malik eyes a young lady. Who happens to be Deja. And I guess he's feeling her, but Deja was played by Tyra Banks. Yes. And fun fact, Tyra Banks was actually dating John Singleton at, a at the time. And a lot of people thought that the reason that she got this role was just only because she was dating John Singleton, not because she was a good actress or anything like that. And also, for those of you who are a little younger, Tyra Banks was everything back then because she was really kind of becoming one of the first black supermodels. I know they say there were a few before that, Beverly Johnson and others, but like in the 90s for that generation, as a black supermodel, Tyra Banks was it. Sweet. So we have Young, Gifted, and Black playing, and Malik basically goes back to his coach with his head down asking for his scholarship back. Yeah! Aretha Franklin was the only one who could play that music in the tone of an old Negro spiritual to just let you know how tough it was for Malik to have to go back with his tail between his legs and beg for that spot back on the team. But the and, coach knew he was coming. <laughs> and just for... A little nugget here. Nike bit off of this scene with one of those campaigns that they did for Shakari Richardson mm. back when, you know, she had her whole ordeal with the Olympics. That campaign that came out that is basically lifted from this movie, Higher Learning. Waiting to show y'all why I'm that girl. A full scholarship? You got some nerve. I see what I can do. That makes me go back and think maybe he really didn't mess up his scholarship, but I feel like the coach had something to do with that. Or he was kind of swindled from the beginning, you know, coming here thinking he had a full scholarship and he really didn't uh, and that there would be some issues surrounding that. But so we see that Morris Chestnut's character, there's a commentary being made because he has a white girlfriend and Malik is making this, you know, commentary on that while he's now talking to Deja, Tyra Banks's character. Look at this fool with his bitch. Hey, don't that make you upset as a black woman? I don't want to. Miss Deja. Okay, he was trying to put the lines on Deja. And I've always just thought like, what is, I don't know, does this work? Depends on the man. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess it, I guess it don't matter. It doesn't matter what you say, it's who's saying it. Probably so. 
little bit. But and we see that Malik, even though she gives him a little bit of play, he's still a self-centered. You be looking at me, right? You you, you looking at my form. You imitating me, right? You looking at me. Look, you know. I seen you too, acting like you all that. So life. you be looking at me? You be looking at me, right? Look at you. You be looking at me, right? You know, so he still has this thing where, you know, the ego must be fed. And then another thing that we see contrasted where he's saying, I want to see that you're safe. I want to walk you back. Why you want to know where I live? I just wanted to walk you home. Make sure you get this safe. A lot of crazies out here. He's telling Deja, you know, yeah, he, he said there's a lot of crazies. There's a lot of crazies out here. He's going to walk her home and make sure she gets safe. And this is so contrasted against kind of the way that the guys from the frat house uh, were doing, the, you know, the girls. He's like, hey, you know, I, I, I want to be a gentleman. So now we see Deja and Malik together in the library. She is helping him get his academics together. Fragment. Fragment. That's a whole lot of red ink. Do you want help? I'm here. Malik, you gotta get this to flow. And right now it's not flowing. And I'm telling you, you know, I think that this is one of the benefits of, <laughs> for him anyway, and a lot of men, of having a, a lady in your life. Because if she's doing well, he's going to do well. Because she's going to help him get where he needs to be. He's reaping the benefits. She's showing him, hey, you know, look, this, is, this has got to be corrected. And because he believes in her and her abilities, I think it changes the way that he saw what Professor Phipps was saying. See, before he felt like Professor Phipps was just picking on him. But in reality, now he has another person like, look, you, you know, your writing is jacked up and it needs a little bit of help. And so she is helping him get where he needs to go. So we also see Malik and Deja at this Halloween party where they're, you know, all dressed up and we see him kind of slide his hands down toward her hips. And she slides them right back politely back up to, you know, to her waist. To me, what I see that means is that the boundaries are intact and he respects her boundaries. Again, in sharp contrast to what we saw with Billy and Kristen earlier in the film. And we see that Dreads and Monet may have gotten together. I know, right? <laughs> so now we see that Malik is becoming more and more disgruntled with this idea that he is running in exchange for his education. And he's complaining about it to Deja. I'm tired of running and studying. I feel like a slave. And Deja is coming back like, why you got to take the everything so far? You have an opportunity that other people don't have. And a lot of people would die for the opportunity that you have. So you should just take it and shut up, basically. Why you always got to take stuff so far? There are people that would die to be where you are right now, and you tripping. Like Morris Chestnut's character, he's like, hey, I, I really love running, and I think that this is going to take me somewhere. It seems that Malik is running so that he can go to school. And there's this conflict there where I don't really want to be doing this extra thing. I'd rather just go to school like most other people in school. Right. Where they don't have this other basically a full time job outside of school just to be able to fund going to school. And he feels like he's being owned, right? He's saying that school doesn't care about him. And he realizes that and he doesn't want to basically be working for somebody who has no interest in his or doesn't have his best interest at heart. There are always those people, right? There are those people when you point out the problems with society or the problems that we have in this country and anywhere else, it's like, well, you know, you should just be thankful for what you have and not uh, shake the table, you know. But my question to folks who believe like that would be, why can't you be thankful and shake the table, right? Is is saying that there are problems and deficiencies and that we should look at things differently, is that in and of itself meaning that you're not thankful? No, I wanted a, a continuous quality improvement. I want it to be better. And I feel like that's what Malik is saying. But, you know, again, Deja has a different philosophy. She's like, be thankful, do your running and do what you got to do. So then, of course, their, you know, not really argument, but their discussion devolves into the black man versus the black woman thing. Because Malik is like, you have it easier than me. You know, you just enjoying your scholarship while I'm being asked for my ID. You all honky dory with your scholarship. They'll let that harmless black woman through easier than a man. When the reality is that, yes, being a black man and being a black woman might be two very different experiences, but nobody's got a monopoly on the oppression that each experiences, even if we might experience them from different angles. But you got to stop doing this all the time and start doing this. So she's basically saying the same thing that Professor Phillips saying, look to yourself. It's your own fault. That your life is hard and you have these struggles. As a black man in America, my stress comes from everywhere. So now we're at a point in the movie where we see Malik is coming into who he's probably going to be for a while. Look at this. 
Columbus. Who wasn't nothing but a thief, mass murderer, slaughtered millions of Native Americans. We got a holiday and a university named after his honor. Earlier in the film, we saw Fudge ask him the question about standing up for the national anthem and everybody's looking at him. And he didn't really have an answer, right? Mm -hmm. And he was looking for approval. Now he's just boldly stating his positions, partially because of how um, Professor Phipps teaches Right. And giving them that sort of perspective of, you know, basically formulating your own ideas and also the influence from Fudge and, you know, kind of what he preaches. But I have to say, at the same time, his personality still comes through because now it's still all about him. He's like the black man got it worse than anybody else. And, you know, all of that. And he doesn't mean the black man is in encompassing black men, women and men, black mankind. No, he means black men. As in the male. gender, male, period. And I'm like, you always got to make it about you, Malik. She endures him because, you know, she right now is smitten and everything like that. But like Malik would be become annoying at some point. <laughs> then we see Deja say, well, class is a state of mind. Only to learn that in their eyes, we ain't nothing but lower class. Class is a state of mind. Um, Sweetheart, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 Deja. Deja, she is definitely off base with that. And I will say that a lot of what Malik is saying is right, but it's just annoying how he's constantly preaching to her. So then while they're having this whole debate, Remy walks up. History's proven you could be the smartest. You could run the fastest. They still think we're inferior. So we see the face off again. Malik is now in his full on black power mode. And then Remy is in his full on supremacist mode. They have this exchange and he says that, oh, you support the Black Panthers? Well, that's reverse racism. It's that shirt, man. You support the Black Panthers? Yeah, and it's reverse racism, man. And then he has the nerve to call him a coon. Yeah, this is the meeting of these guys. They hadn't met earlier in the film at all, even though the people they know have kind of uh, met, right? Mm -hmm. I, when I look at this movie, I see this duality. I see that these two are the same people, right? You have Remy and his group, and you have uh, Malik and his crew, his group, and they're both very impressionable, right? And yes. they're looking to fit in. Just So Remy trying to fit in, and he found his people right Malik tried to fit in he found his people and they both were fed an ideology and whether or not how it doesn't matter how in-depth or how abreast they are to that philosophy that they think they hold they are fully committed to those uh, philosophies even though they probably don't know that much about it because your boy had barely even read the autobiography of Frederick Douglass at this point and Remy had just met some cats off the street who fed you you know, whatever they wanted to feed you. So I find these cats to be very similar in that sort of way. Not that they are exact opposites, you know, but I find them similar in that they were very impressionable. Yes. And one of the things it reminds me of immediately when I thought about you talking about how, you know, they were impressionable and they got this ideology is actually a biblical reference. But basically in the parable where they're talking about, you know, the word and getting the word and that the, the, and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth and immediately it sprang up and because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. So in, 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 in the explanation of this parable, then you have Jesus explaining like these are the people who hear the word and they immediately receive the word and then they become fanatics of it. Right. Mm. Um, and then you're living like this fanatic. And th but those are always the people who go the hardest. Right. You find people who have been kind of in something for a long time. They are a little bit more mellow. But the people who are early and eager, that would be like what we see with Remy and Malik in this movie. Yeah. And much of that stuff that we talked about happened in, you know, those 90s from those groups. Yep. So then we see Malik start to try to chase after Remy but Deja is there to stop him and she's like stop 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 you know don't get into this fight I'm gonna kick your ass whatever ass you got left fool stop. what and he's like hey basically on site next time you can run but you can't hide what's going on what are you doing man I'm trying to catch the dude put a gun on me man and they're like whoa, whoa, whoa hold on you know they show say, us hold on you're black yeah you're black wait hold on <laughs> show us your ID you know right, 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 right. Let's see right here. you don't need to see no damn ID. So it's still continuing to be ridiculous. Then we see Remy actually make his escape. And the two security cats are holding Malik. And, and it just shows like with all we talked about in, you know, 
about these groups back in the day that they get away scot free because of all the stuff they're doing. But there's always an eye on what black people are doing. And we're always, you know, the we always suspected of something while these groups are just going unchecked. And we seen what happened, you know, 30 years later, right? And where we have come because of this or 25 years later, right? Like what, what this has led to where they have turned a blind eye to these extremist groups and have been targeting black folks for all these years. In the aftermath, you know, everybody's crowded around after Remy's gotten away. Let's do me a favor, will you? Oh, yeah, man, see if we cool, can uh, find a... And campus security sees everybody else out there, but the group of black people that's there is who they're going to try to target. Let's break it up. Everything is fine now. And Fudge has had enough. And what do you mean break it up? Look at those white folks standing over there. And he's like, this guy got a gun pulled out on him, but you telling us to break it up. Boy, you going to pull a gun out in this man's face and you asking us to break it up? Fuck you. The reference to breaking up black groupings, groupings of black people goes all the way back mm. into the times of slavery. You could not even congregate, not for church, not for nothing else, because you might be up to, quote, no good, meaning you might be trying to escape this oppression. Yeah, you, might you might be trying, be trying to, to run rebel. away. You might be trying to bail out on the free labor that we are enjoying on your back, you know. So this is something that is ingrained. And I mean, I would just have to go here and say that, you know, the modern police force has its roots in slave catchers and this is essentially what this uh, campus police campus police you know they are a kind of a wing of that right they are a, f a form of law enforcement on the campus and so the philosophies are really no different in terms of the way that they look at groups and profile groups and everything else so no you cannot have a group of black people maybe two of y'all can stand there and talk but not for too long but certainly not you know five to ten of you all in a group that's off limits but also in the scene, Fudge actually saw them in their suspenders and their bald heads. So then he went and got the crew and they showed up. Because campus security surely didn't find them. Yeah! And then we see the two groups begin to go at it and scrap and fight right there on the campus. What happened to your face? So when Deja comes, she sees that Malik's got a black eye and he's all messed up and the guys are all around hyped up because of the fight that they've had. I'm the original man. I'm God. She's upset with him that he's been fighting. Put the ice on it, Malik. Yeah, because she say, Instead, I, I fight, fight with this. this. Yeah, I fight with my brain. I fight with my mind. And that's really kind of like you said, what Professor Phipps was saying as well. And it's kind of what God was saying, right? But once... Remy dropped out, then, quote, you have to take another route because he ain't fighting with his mind no more after he's dropping out of school. Pretty much. Then we find out that Malik is saying he's going to take a semester off so he could figure some stuff out. Why are you fighting like some thug? This is college. Man, I don't know about that no more. About to take me a semester off, let this shit cool out. So there are still these parallels between Malik and Remy. Remy didn't dropped out. Malik, I mean, we all know what happens after you take a semester off. <laughs> So then we see Remy sitting up in his sniper's nest, basically waiting to do the deed. <laughs> Remy takes the opportunity when a plane is overhead uh, to begin taking his first uh, hits. Shit. Chaos breaks out. <laughs> And who's ever on stage is talking about everybody stay calm. Everybody stay calm. <laughs> Bruh, it's somebody on the roof shooting. And you kind of knew it was going to happen, but Deja got here. <laughs> At this point in the movie, it's like we are experiencing everything through Malik's eyes because you notice that all of the screams and stuff start to fade out and we don't hear really anything except just this uh, able to see the sight of, you know, Deja um, in her last moments. Deja yells out why, and then they do this long shot, pulling out, revealing Christopher Columbus. 
And then Professor Phipps comes and he uh, assesses the situation and says, you know, we got to get her to the hospital. We have to get her to the hospital. Malik is just shell shocked by all of the sights and sounds and everything that has happened. When he comes to, it's like he is singularly focused on getting Remy. We see Remy and Malik face off once again on the stairwell. Remy tries to grab his piece from the back. Peep the shot of George Washington in the background. Then Malik is just losing it. He is completely choking Remy out, telling him that he's about to die. You gonna die now! Malik had successfully apprehended the shooter and campus police come and they attack Malik and then they comfort the shooter and let him go. So we see the campus police is negotiating with Remy and Remy says he's sorry. They're like, we know, we know. What are you doing? Sorry. It's okay. We know. They're doing everything they can to preserve his life. And at the same time in the background, you see Malik, you know, in handcuffs. I'm sorry. They did terrible police work and they brought him to where, <laughs> to where Remy was. I don't know if that was to advance the story to so that he can see this happen, but I don't know why the security cats would do that. Ineptitude. I wanted to build things. So we see Remy continuing to have a meltdown and he's saying, you know, I wanted to be an engineer. Basically, he sees all of his dreams slipping away in this act that he has done. I wanted to be an engineer. You could still be an engineer. He says it hurts, you know, because really he had an existence that was very painful being this outcast. Uh, and then, you know, getting involved with that group just ruined him in the end. Remy offs himself. And they all see it and the cops are screaming, no. Yeah, that was like the most painful thing to them. Not what you did to all those people outside, but that they just were doing everything they could to preserve his life. And how many times have we seen that in the in, in cases that have been reported? You know, people who go and they do heinous things and then they get uh, fed cheeseburgers after the fact. And, you know, everything you can to bring comfort, comfort and preserve the life of the people who have done all of these uh, terrible acts. No! Malik stumbles out the building and no ambulance was there for him or no EMTs, nothing. And he sees Professor Pips and he's looking at him, hopefully hoping that maybe he was wrong. Maybe Deja has survived, but he knows the truth when the professor looks down and he's just devastated. And in this moment, the emotional and the physical pain that he is going through, all the professor can do is just literally bring him to the ground and embrace him and try to hold him through the moment. Right. Their relationship before was a political nature, you can say. They talk politics and back and forth and that. And in this, it's no politics, even though politics brought them to this point. It's all I can. All we can do is have a basic human connection. No words even being said in this moment. And the part that just breaks me every time when he reaches his hand out and he just screams her name. Lisa! So that's how it ends. Deja is unfortunately lost, you know, at the hands of Remy and his crazy antics that he yeah. did in this movie. So to me, I think it's a question of whether they would have gotten along, right? Because we saw they were kind of different, right? And it's, you know, she was kind of like, you know, you need to fight with your mind. More, more of a, uh, the idea of that it's us, right? Versus stop you know, versus mm -hmm. there are outside things that causes the problems for us. Right. And whether or not you even take that into account when you're determining how you're going to interact with the world. Right. right? And with that, I think it's about if it's just they're that different, which in which case they don't make it. And Malik not being mature. And then he's gaining maturity throughout the film, because that's what we see throughout the film. He kind of got mature, but is it to another level once she actually died too? Right. Does that change him? So to me, I think the final metamorphosis happens when Deja dies, but we're rolling it back, roll back the clock. Let's assume that maybe she got shot and, you know, she survived her wounds. Okay. Not these same wounds for you, you know, armchair doctors in, <laughs> in the, in the uh, comment section. What I mean is that let's assume maybe she didn't get hit or, you know, she survived it. Whatever the case, 
um, if the incident still occurs, then I think Malik is very much like he always always was. And, you know, as we saw toward the end of the film, and then he still stays on that trajectory. I think the loss of Deja just could have completely changed, you know, where kind of the direction of his life. We don't even know if he's going to continue with college after this. But if it doesn't happen, if Deja survives, I go back to what you said. Malik was changing completely throughout this film. We talked about how his philosophies changed when he started interacting with Fudge, Ice Cube's character. And, you know, he was also impacted, I think, somewhat by Deja throughout the film. But but we didn't see Deja really change that much. She was, to me, consistently who she was from the moment we met her. Right. And she's like, hey, you know, I got this opportunity at this school. This is our job. This is how we make it. This is how we survive it. Um, and she's used to this environment. And yeah, but the- see, <laughs> I understand that, but it makes me think of the writing, right? Because mm-hmm. you write women characters and then we don't really show black women. The white woman, we've seen her growth and her change. That's but true. But the black woman, we don't get to see that. Right. We just see her dying in. Right. And Thumbs I mean, down on that. <laughs> yeah. And she's presumably also new to the team, too. So she's just going through getting acclimated to things. But maybe she came from a different background. Like, I feel in a way like Malik really didn't come from a hugely diverse background before he went to college. So this is his first semester in college. And, you know, maybe it is very different for him to be in a background where, um, you know, if you came from maybe an all black environment to now you are in this environment with all of these different people and cultures and dynamics, especially like the Remy dynamic, right? Yeah. But he, so would actually living with those white girls that they just talked about. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but what if she went to a white school, like her high school, well, you know what I'm saying? Then what, she already would be used to that dynamic. But what I'm saying is it's a movie and you make something happen for this character to, develop more than just starting the same way that she ends right so to kind of get to the answer to the question would they have made it as a couple Hmm. okay you know you guys know i always believe in love and i want to believe in love i want to believe they could have made it as a couple and out of the other couples from different movies that we've analyzed i think maybe they have a pretty good chance of that because if they go through this together and let's say the shooting happens or whatever, and she survives, like that could be the thing that brings them together even more like, Oh, look, you know, they tried, but they didn't win. And especially with Malik's attitude. Plus there's no question in my mind that they actually do love each other. And when you listen, that's the message that the, that John Singleton, um, the writer and, director of this film wanted us to have because even in the song that they're playing Raphael Sadiq. Raphael Sadiq is singing and he's like I love you Deja so he he loves her it is no doubt and I think she loves him too and she's she's willing to invest in him right she's helping him with his schoolwork. she's you know basically in, pouring into this relationship which is not uncommon but I think she loves him and I think he does love her too yeah and you know, outside of them having this passion for each other, right, or the same interest in track, then I really don't know much about them, though. Are they interested in track? That's another question I had. Or do they just run it? Yeah. Is this your ticket to college or do you love track? You know, and that's kind of compare and contrast that to um, Love and Basketball, a, a video or a movie that we've recently covered. Um, and that's very different because those characters loved basketball. These characters characters here i don't know deja and malik they just know. this I is just how they're paying people, for school people who come to this level kind of do maybe but it's possibly it's not right because you may look at it going in when you're in high school or mm-hmm. middle school like okay i'm going to do this and eventually be able to get scholarship to pay for school or something but see i think that those people like it generally and that's why they end up competing at the levels that they do But then Malik, remember, at the beginning of the film, he comes on and he's missing time and whatever. Right. He didn't feel like he was going to come to practice and he was kind of BSing around. Oh, my stomach was hurting. Uh, You know, because he well, it's nobody likes practice. Right. (laughs) We talking about practice. (laughs) We talking about practice. He wants to go and race. Right. Mm -hmm. So he might love racing when it's time to race. And then we see how that ends up. But either way, you know, and I think it was this fudge to more talking about how he changed. Fudge got him to thinking about, oh, you don't even really need this right now because your passion is now attached to some monetary gain for the university. Right. And that's why I don't know how you undo 
what Fudge has instilled in him to that level because he kind of was radicalized in a sense. Yeah. Like Remy. Right. And they were seemed to be getting further and further apart Mm -hmm. in that sense where she stayed where she was, which is kind of totally opposite of Fudge. And he going closer to Fudge's area. I think they're just going in different directions. Mm, That's a really good point. Like, I don't know. I like to believe they could have stayed together, but it just depends on how much Rem- um, Remy, it just depends on how much Malik was going to change. Yeah, You know, how much was he going to change? How much could he be like her? Because I really do believe but, the success of the long term relationship is going to be- rely on well, how much their life philosophies are compatible. It doesn't mean they have to be yeah, identical, but, but they can't be in conflict. Because John Singleton and them didn't write it well enough for us doesn't mean that we shouldn't be talking about if Deja actually changed, too. Mm-hmm. She went more into the route where everybody went in the in the nineties, really. But let me tell you, if she gets shot and survives, oh, she yeah. that 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 could be very well. Be like, the so thing. what was that book you were reading? Yeah, she would like tell me about that. <laughs> I want to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. You know, <laughs> like be, because maybe her approach had been working up to this point. Yeah, I might get accused of step theft, or you know, people are looking at me and I'm stereotyped as the black girl, right? But. I still am kind of surviving in this situation. But if somebody, because of the reasons that Remy does do all of that, and by the way, if, uh, cause this was a kind of condensed version where we're solely focusing on uh, Deja and, and Malik. If you want to see our full breakdown, it's actually on our other channel, uh, Axiom Amnesia. We have it linked in the description and it is a two hour breakdown and we would love it if you would watch it and everything. Unfortunately, because of some of the sub- subject matter, it is um, practically demonetized and it's not advertised a lot. But you can learn a lot watching that because we did a fair amount of uh, research in order to present to you um, some of the underlying things that are going on in the dynamics from this film. So anyway, back to Deja and Malik. I, you know, I, I'd like to see them together. That's maybe the best yeah. I can say. But so I think they could have because, you know, a lot of, especially if you go through something like that, but not considering that, you know, a lot of people get together around college time or just after, you know, and that's where, you know, back in those days and times before when you were finding your lifelong mate, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, if this was like a, um, gro- not is it grownish? If it was like a grownish type thing, I don't know what I don't yeah. know what happened in that series, That's, y'all. Yeah, the TV show. But if it was in that time frame, I kind of probably just say no. It wouldn't. Work. <laughs> they not gonna stay together because ain't nobody staying together. Yeah, yeah. We talked about that dynamic a whole lot, and not to get off the subject with the love and basketball thing, but one of the comments which I think would bode well here too is just about we were discussing how these films and the love relationships in these films were per- perceived differently. You look at when this film came out in the nineties, it's it, how we received it. When I saw this film in the nineties, the culture, you know, what was the culture of love? What was the expectation? Just like what you pointed out, but fast forward to today, people are maybe going to college for different reasons, you know, and um, don't see this kind of, I'm there in permanent relationships that could happen and connections I make might be, you know, who I wind up marrying and being with. But even more importantly, one of the commenters, I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was, but one of them said, you know, ask the question of, you know, how will the younger people who watch this, I mean, by younger, we mean like, you know, in your 20s, through, you know, up to about the age of 30. How do you receive it? Because one of the things we always hear with regard to the 90s relationships is the word toxic. So many people describe this was a toxic relationship. And hey, Omar Epps, other character in Love and Basketball, talking about him playing Q and then uh, Monica in that movie. Oh, toxic, toxic, toxic. The movie was stupid, stupid, stupid. And I just think that people are looking at it through whatever the lens, the cultural lens of their generation. Yeah. Like everything else. Yeah, I think that's the case. But yeah, just in general, though, I think the way that they develop their love on screen, right? Because it was kind of immediately. It wasn't as, oh, this cat and mouse chase. And they didn't meet to actually halfway through the movie, mm-hmm. just about. Well, he saw her at first, yeah, like that but, very first day, but they didn't really start talking. Yeah, exactly. Until but like the in track movie meet. sense, you know, if it's like a love story, halfway through is when, you know, he just goes up and they immediately, you know, 
get together like it wasn't no uh like what's the uh, stomp the yard and those sort of movies uh-huh. i think it was stomp the yard one of them types where you they don't really get together and then you got to do all this extra stuff and act like i need a tutor and stuff they probably stole that from this film well then an important but, point here is that it wasn't like the type of relationship line, yeah. yeah but it also wasn't i have to win the girl this movie was not about it being a, a love story right it's this was just one of the sub plots that was going on throughout yeah, the but whole you movie. needed it if it's gonna be she the one get off then he's the main character at the end yeah you know so uh i guess they didn't waste time with the chase and then it's just like all right they're together so to me when this happens it's like yeah this is kind of they feeling each other and then maybe throughout life they're willing to make it work for whatever reason yeah you know yeah but it reminded me of this youtube couple uh who both ran track <laughs> Oh, yeah, they're new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did both run track in college, and now they have a uh, big Yeah, that's what I was thinking of when I was like, oh, people meet in college and stuff, and they're runners. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, shout out Promise View. Yeah, if you you happen to check out um, Promise View, they're a black couple, and they have a 21-acre plot of land and homestead, I guess you could call it, um, that is on a lake and everything, and they're a young couple, and they bought this. And we found their vlogs and we just started like binging them. So if you go over there, you let them know that Axiom Amnesia <laughs> sent you if you make a comment <laughs> because we really enjoy. But all of a sudden there we had been watching them before their channel really blew up. And then all of a sudden their channel blew up. Uh, if you look for I think it's like 21 Acre Farms and I'll just link that one of the, that yeah, main video. Yeah. yeah. In in the uh, description. But if you do comment and let them know that we uh, sent you guys over here because we really enjoy their videos. Yeah. Uh, um, now I can say I imagine this is what they were like in college, but I don't know how long they knew each other or anything. This is just me making they knew up. each other from high school, oh, okay. according to their story. Because, <laughs> and you know, I just love it. I just love the, you know, to see uh, younger black couples doing their thing. So at the end of it all, uh, I, I'm going to say my vote is that they stay together and they, if, yeah. yeah, if they have this incident and they survive this together, then that is like their Ooh, bond. We didn't mention something. What? What if he doesn't die Uh huh. and they get, they get together, but does Malik stay in school? Yes, because I think in this case, Malik's <laughs> going to do what she does. He'll be where she is. She has enough pull with him. Especially he was already after... talking about dropping out, though. Yeah, but well. Before, mm. right? Okay, I'm does Malik stay off. in school or worse yet, does she stay in school? Or do Ooh. they both say, we're going to go to an HBCU? Oh, they drop, and, or they drop out and they have this struggle love for the rest oh of their Oh, my life. gosh. <laughs> I d- go to the comments and tell us what you think. All right, so what's the scenario if they if they survive this incident or whatever? And then, you know, so long as we're coming up with these crazy scenarios, okay, what if she survives? Like, she is shot and everything, but she does survive, but, like, she's significantly significantly impaired in some way like she's oh, she now maybe she can't run anymore uh or she you know is is un- unfortunately wheelchair bound or something but something that impacts her but let's just say she is uh, becomes other abled as a result of what happens here does Malik stay with her? Has Ooh. the love grown enough that Malik will be like yes I'm gonna propose to you you can be my wife I love you. Or is Malik like, I'm so sorry this happened to you. We can be lifelong friends, but I'm going to be looking on to the next chick. Bruh. What do you think Malik does? a whole does? lot. Me? Yes. Uh, I think he gets with somebody else. Mm-hmm. But it's like one semester. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. But maybe he feels obligated to kind of stay there and take care of her. And then, you know, like we say, when there's time, it's just going to get stronger. Yep. So maybe that's what happens. Yep. That's what I... So I think... Ooh, it could go either way. But you know what? The way Malik at the end of that movie when she was gone and he just like screamed out her name like that, man, I like to believe that if she had survived, that he would have stayed, you know, with her and probably wouldn't have got with anybody else. This could be just Cherie in fairy tale fantasy land. But it, I, that's the way I want to remember it. Uh, or, it, you know, or imagine it, reimagine what would happen if she could have survived at the end. Um, you know, but I, I think. I think he I think bad things can either go either way. Right. You could either wind up where it's the thing that's just like causes you to break up and you're just not together. Deja goes back home to her family and then they figure out what to do about her medical situation or 
you know, whatever. Because the other part is like they don't have it's not like they got a lot of money. You know, they can't just be like, oh, I'm going to do this. If he goes and gets a job, you know, they both are starting at the bottom, you know, because you're young, like they're young. Yeah. They're just like 18, 19 years old. Yeah. But so that's it. Yeah. But let us know if you would like us to talk about Taryn, Kristen and Wayne. Mm, that three way interesting situation that happened in this movie. Again, be sure to check out the full version of this breakdown. It's like two hours long. You'll love it. It's in the link in the description. If you made it this far into this nice long breakdown, type Deja in the comments so we know you're one of the real ones who stick around. Thank you so much. And don't forget to check out the video that is on the screen right now. <laughs>